I suppose like most people in Ireland, I'm familiar with those reports about caravans of displaced people moving through Central America trying to escape cartels, gang violence, and a whole variety of threats. But the Mayan people, I came to Guatemala City, went to the Memory Museum, and there I was reminded that these people have been dealing with this since the time of the conquistadors. And it's like generation after revolution, after generation after revolution, these people have been pushed off their own land. So they emanated from here hundreds of years ago, and they've been pushed off this land on numerous occasions. So what we did is we traveled from Guatemala City for seven or eight hours, nine hours maybe, to get here to where Maria lives with her family in this little community. And the thing that really struck me was, despite what they've been through, they actually have a very gentle relationship with the land, a very light footprint in this place because they seem to share each other's allotments, their animals move freely from one person's place to another, the children run from house to house, and they gave us a huge welcome. I think they have a particular grow, I suppose is the word, for, for Trokra, for Cook, and for the other people who are working on the ground to try and speak up on their behalf, because one of the challenges they have is actually language. For such a sophisticated, ancient culture, many of them don't speak Spanish, and certainly not English. So when someone comes and says, vamos, they don't know how to deal with that. So I think above all else, what we can do on their behalf is speak up on their behalf, and represent them and speak up to authority because they're such a gentle people, I think they need us. Travelling through the Polochic Valley as we have, you have to marvel at the quality of the land. It's, it's very enriched, I suppose, in the Polochic River flowing through the valley. Having arrived here at the Mayan ceremony to see the, uh, the produce that people make in their own little plots, you can see that this place is perfect for producing food. When I spoke to Ermelinda about that, he said to me that the people feel that the, 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 the palm oil production is such a waste of good land, that these trees, that they don't do anything in terms of fertilizing the soil, and they kind of break with that cycle of life that's part of the Mayan culture. And equally, when I spoke to Anna, uh, you know, we spoke about having celebrated and honored her ancestors here today, I wondered, what the future might bring and what, what her legacy might be to her people, working as she does with Cook. And she said that if nothing else, she would like the women in the community to find the strength and the confidence to stand up and speak as eloquently as she did here today. The thing that really I found very moving here today was the warmth of the welcome for the trokera and for the Cook workers. There was a, like a big round of applause. There was a kind of, it, it seemed to be a validation for the work that they're going on with here, struggling as they are against huge forces. It really was quite moving in there. You know, meeting the women of Separate Zarco and particularly having my conversation with Carmen earlier on today was not only uh, a privilege but it was also quite humbling because when you consider that these people live in a very remote area of Guatemala where women have virtually no rights, uh, they live in a, in a very, very simple way, no money and no Spanish and for them to stand up against the, the might of the military and those who oppress them was really breathtaking. But what I also found hugely interesting was the supports that they got. It was such a long process that without the civil rights defenders helping them, uh, translating for them, taking their testimonies, also preparing the community for what these women were about to do. In other words, to stand up and tell their story. At a time when most of the men here would probably have said, stop, you're shaming our community. Shh, keep it under wraps. We know that story at home. And they lived it out here, and inch by inch, mile by mile, over six years, they brought their case into Guatemala City, where they don't speak Spanish. The, the, the supports had to be found, the legal supports. And thanks to Trocora, maybe some couple sitting at home, putting a few shillings in the Trocora box, in some way, 
went to, to fund that campaign that not only liberated these women, but also, I suppose, all of us in many ways. And what was really wonderful today, and Carmen said this to me, was how the shift had come in the men of the community. That church was packed today with people, not ashamed, but celebrating the courage of their women. And that's what's gone on here today. It's gone from absolute abject poverty and abuse to a celebration and empowerment. Very moving, I have to say. Today we're high in the hills of Guatemala in the city of Coban and after a very long day it's rapidly getting dark and getting cold. It's been a day of, of heartache in many ways because we've heard the testimony of people from the area who have suffered violence, sexual violence, physical violence, torture and this is a centre where many of the disappeared are still missing. So we've met people today who are, above all else, frustrated at the delays in trying to get justice. There's the old cliché about justice delayed is justice denied, and that seems to be very much the case here. And after years and years and years of finding the strength to stand up and make their case, now there's an amnesty proposed which would see the perpetrators of this left off. They're on remand, some of them, but they would be uh, given an amnesty and not face the rigours of justice. I spoke to some people here today who, in essence, said to me that you can land grab in this part of the world and it can take generations to try and sort it out, whereas if you break into someone's garden, you'll be in jail by nightfall. There's still a nervousness towards the military here. Some families, clearly, who have soldiers in the family don't feel so frightened by a uniform, but when a patrol passes through town, you can see how people brace themselves and there is still a nervousness. They're still a frightened and a very hurt people and the, the big message that came out of Coban for me today was we need help and we need it now. A lot of the people who have suffered are growing old and it now looks as though many of them will be dead before they ever see justice, if they ever see justice. Well, finally back in Guatemala City at the airport and bound for home. But you know, that was a pretty full-on week. It was a long road be times and it was a very emotional road, but nothing in comparison to what the native Guatemalans have travelled and suffered on their road to justice and to freedom and they still haven't got there. Um, I heard stories of systematic sexual abuse, we went out into the countryside and spoke to the families of the disappeared, we've heard about genocide, we've seen the displacement of people and just last night when we got back into Guatemala City we paid a courtesy call to Casa de Migrante which is also supported by Trocora and there they had a full house again in this halfway house for people who are on the road trying to escape persecution and the variety of the stories really underlines the crisis that the whole region is in. Met a young man from Honduras who was a, a gay campaigner and because he's uh, known to the public to be a gay campaigner and because the regime has gone backwards he's now under threat of death at home. I met a man from El Salvador who said there's a gang going to shoot him if he ever returns home. There was a woman who told me she had a 10 year old boy with her that the narcos or the drugs gangs were trying to force to work for them and uh, at the end of the evening I met a guy who told me that he was in the Honduran military but when asked to act against his own people he and 32 of his colleagues in the army fled, they deserted the army and they're in Guatemala trying to get out. This morning we went to visit Abelino, a wonderful man, he's been a, an activist working with farmers and with his community for many many years and he has been held in a high security prison for over two years now without trial for in essence uh, for, for, for trespassing on a banana plantation and this seems to be the, the kind of the meeting point of the problem where the wealthy seem to uh, be able to maintain their standard of living and to acquire land while the dispossessed can't seem to find an ear. 
Now, hopefully, he will find justice before too long. Trokra continues to assist uh, him in his search for justice, not so much for himself, but for his people. He has two small children still at home. And also, out on the field, miles and miles and miles into the countryside, anywhere we went where we met representatives of Cook or little farming organisations or women's groups in small towns, they came out with open arms to welcome the Trokra workers and their partners. They feel safe, they feel they have someone who's educated, who can speak Spanish on their behalf, but to be honest, the education was ours this week. And the one thing they asked for, there was no one asked for tips, no one asked for money, there was none of that stuff. The one thing they asked us to do was not to forget them. It was a remarkable trip and I just hope the work goes on and that Ireland can continue to play its part.